Welcome to another session of lectures by Lobezy. I'm your host, Dr. Lobezy. Today we're going to be talking about World War I. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and get started uh, with the causes. Okay, so if we look at our study guides and our notes, um, there are a number of underlying causes. The um, an, an acronym MANIA is sometimes used as a useful way to remember the underlying causes. MANIA, the M standing for militarism, A, alliances and nationalism, I, imperialism, and then A, the trigger, um, assassination. Uh, sometimes I like to jokingly uh, add a K for maniac, sort of, and then include Kaiser, Kaiser Wilhelm II, because uh, as you'll see uh, throughout this video that he certainly did some things that uh, helped cause the war as well. But um, I just want to make a note before we get going that nationalism is probably the most... Uh, significant and powerful of the underlying causes and so with that we'll start um, we've spent a lot of time this course talking about nationalism and of course um, you know during the 19th century especially it seemed to be a cause for change a cause for good um, brought about democracy brought about self-rule um, all throughout Europe, the continent, and um, it was, you know, a force that brought people uh, together. But by the 1850s, we started to see nationalism appear as a um, source of tension between different ethnic groups and uh, the one that comes to mind is Austria uh, following their defeat by Prussia in the Austrian Prussian War there was created the dual monarchy which uh, wasn't at least an attempt to deal with some of the um, some of the nationalistic feelings of the Hungarians who wanted you know a country of their own at any rate um, while we're talking about the unification of Prussia, they also took Alsace-Lorraine. And Alsace-Lorraine was a um, natural resource uh, rich uh, region right on the border uh, between uh, it was France and, and some of the Germanic territories. So when Prussia took this territory, they did so in an attempt to convince some of those southern Germanic uh, nation or states of the Germanic Confederation to join with Prussia in the unification. But this was something that France never uh, forget, forgot nor forgave. Uh, it created a, um, a legacy of bitterness. Um, the French wanted revenge. They wanted that territory back. Um, and so that was something um, that meant that as long as Germany now possessed Alsace-Lorraine, France was going to be uh, their enemy. And so when we look at underlying causes, nationalism is uh, very significant. Okay, uh, Down here we look at uh, militarism, Okay, and we can see that um, two, two important um, points two important points should be readily noticeable and that is a Germany has the largest standing military meaning army and then Great Britain has the largest navy uh, there was an Admiral von Tirpitz uh, who convinced Kaiser Wilhelm II of the need to build up their navy um, that's not anything that's super out of the ordinary though there was a I believe it was a American author by the name of uh, Alfred T. Mann who talked about the it was more of a it was a book that he wrote um, forget the name offhand but um, it was a look through history at all the powerful empires that have existed and one of the things that he noted that they all held in common was that they had great navies and so all the in his estimation, 
countries that want to be strong needed a strong navy. So sort of that, you know, some of that came from his uh, his book that influenced uh, uh, Admiral von Tirpitz. And at any rate, they began a uh, naval arms race uh, where they triggered a naval arms race. And it was something that made Great Britain feel threatened because typically or historically, at least, Great Britain and Prussia and Germany have never had any um, bad relations. And so if you look at it from an ethnic standpoint, the British people are actually Germanic. Uh, English language is a Germanic language. And so uh, there are some nationalistic ties between uh, Germans and, and uh, the English but um, or the British. But this starts the um, or continues the animosity that's being uh, heightened uh, or tension that's increasing between the two countries. Uh, something that I wanted to also note, um, and it's not in the notes, but that Germany um, may had to make a decision. They didn't have enough money to build up their navy and to continue to build up their uh, military. Uh, their army, rather, there were those that wanted to enlarge their army even more so. Um, and, you know, when you look at it, you look at World War One. there were very few uh, battles. There was really only one significant naval battle, and that was the Battle of uh, Jutland. But it, it was sort of unnecessary for Germany to have a strong such a strong navy if they would have invested more money in their army then perhaps the outcome might have been different so that money that went to the navy was you know in essence taken from the army the other thing is uh that the officer class of the army was selected from uh the junkers and these are the you know, the hereditary landowners, the nobles of uh, old Prussia. And if they would have enlarged their army, um, that would have meant that they wouldn't have had enough officers and that they would have, with an enlarged army, they would have needed more officers. And so what they would have needed to do is um, open it up to non-noble um, uh, candidates. So that was something that they were uh, unwilling to do. So there's a there's a lot of Prussia or Germany that's kind of stuck in the past, even though it's sort of economically a very modern country, um, politically and even socially, it's it's sort of stuck, uh, uh, sort of in the 18th century. But anyway, um, moving on, uh, we want to come back to nationalism again, and this is an area. Coke Zero is so good. Um, the other area that's important uh, is the Balkans, southeastern Europe. All right. Um, this was a territory that the um, I've referred to the Ottomans as the boogeyman of Europe for so for so long. Well, um, by the end of the 18th century, excuse me, the end of the 19th century into the 20th. Uh, they become known as the sick man of Europe, and that's because they're a receding power. Um, you may recall that they, uh, in their uh, heyday, had reached uh, the gates of Vienna, uh, laid siege to Vienna twice, um, and so they've fallen um, since those days. And so what we see is this territory that has gained its independence, so you, this is what the Ottoman Empire looked like um, prior to Austria-Hungary annexing Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, and then what we see is that Serbia has gained its independence along with Bulgaria and Romania, but that the Serbian um, people, there was a tremendous amount of nationalistic fervor in that they wanted to unite all of the southern Slavic people, okay, uh, Yugoslavs, that means southern Slavs, and <clears throat> before that they they could do that, Austria-Hungary moved in, who Austria-Hungary also had inside of its, um, even before the annexation, they had uh, Serbians that, you know, uh, lived in their um, 
empire and probably would have been discriminated against and been at, at best second-class citizens. So the Serbians already didn't like Austria-Hungary and then when Austria-Hungary annexes Bosnia and Herzegovina, that further enrages them and they want to go to war, but they are talked down from that by the Russians. The Russians are the largest Slavic nation in Europe and therefore see themselves as the protector of all of Europe's Slavs. This is in 1908 um, when Austria-Hungary annexes Bosnia and you may recall that just three years prior to that, Russia had been defeated in the Russo-Japanese War. So they're in no position. They're still licking their wounds. They're in no position to fight. And so they say to Serbia, if you're going to go to war against Austria-Hungary, you're going to do it on your own. And so they stand down. Okay. And Austria-Hungary is allowed to continue um, its control of Bosnia. But the result is bad bad relationships obviously with serbia and also uh, russia okay so what we see here is um a, one of the other uh, causes underlying causes of the uh, world war one and that's militarism okay and so on the left we see the alliance of germany and austria hungary anytime you see one of these um helmets with a spike on it uh, that that's a uh, holdover from the prussian military and so if you see that you see um you can know right away that that stands for germany over here um we see the countries of um, russia france great britain and i'm assuming that's belgium and then here in the middle sort of playing referee is italy okay uh <clears throat> Italy used to be on the uh, alliance with Germany and Austria-Hungary. They were known as the Triple Alliance. And then over here was the Triple Entente. Great Britain had a separate alliance with Belgium. Okay, You may recall in the revolutions of 1830 that Belgium gained its independence from the Netherlands and that Great Britain, in an attempt to try to keep the other powers uh, out of Belgium, and therefore kind of away from the proximity of Great Britain because Great Britain is just across the English Channel from Belgium and they didn't want any foreign powers that close to their shores, made a, uh, made a uh, treaty with Belgium that they would always kind of like defend their independence, you know, so that, the, so that they can um, be a small nation. Uh, and, you know, the benefit going back Prior to 1830, at the Congress of Vienna, they, they merged um, Belgium with the Netherlands to create a, uh, uh, um, you know, sort of a contained France, right? And so when Belgium broke away, Great Britain said, fine, we'll, we'll kind of um, guarantee your security, all right? And so that's why Belgium is in, in this. But this is the Triple Entente. And then uh, Italy is going to jump um, oh, like sides is going to change once the war begins they're going to leave the triple alliance and then they're going to join uh the triple entente which will become known as the uh central no no allied powers excuse me allied powers okay the triple alliance over here will be known as the central powers because they're in the center of europe okay one of the other um, causes, or going back to one of the earlier, and that is uh, militarism. We can see the military spending um, a number. So we have Germany, Austria, Hungary, Italy, Great Britain, Russia, France, 1890, 1900, 1910, 1914. All right, and their military spending is going up, 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 up. But if you look at Germany, they seem to go up. Um, a little bit first and then that you see Great Britain responding and then the dark represents the money that goes on army spending and then this grayer color goes for uh, naval spending okay so if you look at that what I said earlier sort of goes out the window because this chart says that they're spending more money on um, their army but that's Probably right during the, you know, that's in response to declaration of war. Because back here, they're not spending very much on their 
army. Okay, so this is from between 1900 and 1910 is when um, Admiral von Tirpitz convinces Kaiser Wilhelm II to start spending more money on their navy. And then the response is Great Britain starts spending more on uh, on their navy as well. Okay, so that's going to cause increased uh, hostilities, not just between Great Britain and uh, Germany, but the other European countries as well, as you can see. Part of my part of that might be. I mean, I'm seeing this. This is after. I'm assuming this is after the not the after the war has been declared, and all the countries are responding. Okay, um, so down here we have a picture of the Otto von Bismarck, who is a very um, significant, influential uh, German figure, and also you know, he's uh, known for. His uh, diplomatic skill, uh, probably a little less successful on his domestic policies, uh, but certainly from a foreign policy standpoint, he's uh, sort of second to none. But to his right um, is Kaiser Wilhelm II, who, uh, who succeeds Kaiser Wilhelm I, I believe it's his grandfather, in 1890. And so one of the first things that he does um, is he forces Otto von Bismarck to resign um, because he, the excuse he used is that he wanted, um, after they started building up their, well, no, even before then, he wanted uh, empire. He wanted colonies. And um, you may recall that after the unification of Germany, um, Bismarck said that Germany was a satisfied power. So if they're satisfied power, that means that they don't have any interest in taking land elsewhere. But um, th that was sort of the excuse he used. But um, if you read any biographical uh, information on, on uh, Wilhelm, he was sort of, um, he felt threatened by... Bismarck and he didn't he he had to be the the main um you know he he was the lead character uh in the movie you know uh he didn't he wanted he didn't want to share the limelight with anyone and that was sort of his um personality um he was born um Wilhelm uh he was a breech baby uh and so the result of his birth was sort of a paralyzed uh, left arm. And uh, so he sort of grew up with a um, kind of like a chip on his shoulder because of that. And, you know, he had to compensate for that sort of uh, um, useless uh, arm and the way he did so was his personality was very over the top, um, very loud, boisterous, um, sort of sort of a bully, I guess. Um, but it was very um, off-putting in a lot of his relatives. He he is the grandson of uh, Queen Victoria, and uh, so anyway, that's. That's the deal on him. So he he, uh, he he made a mistake because he got rid of him, and then he allowed the uh, um, alliance system that had existed uh, between Great Brit or between uh, Germany, Austria, Hungary, and um, Russia to expire. So if we take a look at those alliances, there was initially the Three Emperors League, and the Three Emperors League um, that's a ID term that you need to uh, know was a way. Well, okay, so let's make sure we understand this. Otto von Bismarck, after they took Alsace and Lorraine, knew that uh, France was always going to be Germany's enemy. And so his response to that was to maintain peace, um, he had to isolate France. And so there's a quote associated with Bismarck that something like, as long as France is without allies, it, you know, she she poses no threat to us. 
And so his way of maintaining peace is to make sure that uh, Germany doesn't, or excuse me, France doesn't have any allies. So he isolates them. And, and, and the way that he does that is um, over on the east is maintaining a relationship with the Russians. Um, the most important ally to Germany was Austria-Hungary, not because of any particular reason other than the fact that from a geographical standpoint, uh, Austria-Hungary is to the south of Germany and can um, kind of protect their southern flank. If, if Austria-Hungary wasn't Germany's ally, they would be sort of surrounded almost on all sides by hostile forces if, you know, conceivably. So that was the one thing that was important to Bismarck was to make sure that they had an alliance with Austria-Hungary. But because Austria-Hungary didn't treat the Slavic people inside their emperor, empire very well, that made Russia uh, angry. So w the genius of Bismarck was able to con it was in that he was able to convince Russia to enter into a treaty with Austria-Hungary, that was the Three Emperors League, and the understanding was that they were going to, because they were all multi-ethnic um, empires, and so they all had um, ethnic minorities that were pushing for independence and that it, it served all of their interests equally to help each other uh, by utilizing the principle of intervention, okay? You know, because the uh, le or the uh, Council of Europe is uh, is over at this point. So he's trying to you know stabilize Europe and maintain peace. But when he comes along, he allows that. And not only that, but the um, okay, not only the Three Emperors League, but uh, Bismarck went and uh, created the um, non or the reinsurance treaty. Um, a separate treaty between Germany and Russia, and then another one between uh, Germany and Austria-Hungary. But Kaiser Wilhelm II allows um, that to lapse. And so not assuming, not thinking because of the political and social differences that exist between Russia and France, uh, Kaiser Wilhelm II doesn't think that uh, it's anything that Germany has to worry about. But, I mean, after the... Reinsurance uh, treaty lapses, that's exactly what happens, right? There's a Franco-Russo alliance created, okay? And then it's not going to be long before the Brits come in because, in part, um, Germany's building up its its navy, all right? And so you can see this is, this is in part, how he is uh, destabilizing um, Europe, Kaiser Wilhelm II. He also gave uh, a, um, he had a, Chance, because again, he he's the uh, he's the grandson of Queen Victoria, um, and so he has an opportunity to uh, make peace or at least smooth things over with Great Britain. And he, um, in the early 20th century, gives a interview with the newspaper, and it just goes horribly because he's very arrogant and sort of insults the British um, for not realizing that. Um, you know, Germany is the ally of Great Britain and that it's the, he blames the press. So, <laughs> the, the more things change, the more they stay the same, right? I think we've heard some leaders blaming the press for things. Interesting. All right. Um, so, if we look, yeah, oh, yeah, this, and I should have shown this before, but this, this is a good graphic because this is exactly what I was talking about, the concern that Germany had. Okay, so Austria-Hungary being on their uh, southern border helps protect their southern flank, right? So now with an alliance between Russia and France, uh, Germany has to potentially fight a two-front war, okay? And even though they have a pretty um, sizable... Oops. Um, army, 890,000, uh, the Russians 
have quite a larger one or a little bit larger. But the problem with Russia is their 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 military, their army is not well equipped. One in four soldiers had uh, rifles, so that's terrible. But look at France. France comes on strong um, and isn't much smaller uh, than Germany's military. The advantage that Germany has is that they're well trained, uh, very disciplined. But um, you know, you can see because of the size of their army, if they would have been able to build up their army a little bit more, they might have you know been able to uh, fight that two front war a little more successfully. Okay, but this is an issue. Okay. The, 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 the fact that they would have to divide their military, okay? So while half is fighting, you know, over here against France, another half is having to fight there, that really minimizes um, or takes away their, you know, advantage of having a sizable military. Um, and then if we look at Great Britain, look at their military, it's tiny, tiny. Um, and uh, the, the reason for that is because they don't have a draft. Uh, or a conscription loss, not until after the war starts. So they're really behind uh, the eight ball when the war starts. They've got a great navy, but that's not gonna that's not gonna do it. All right, uh, Russia's military readiness, yeah, not good at all. They have a very large army, right? The largest in the world, uh, one point four uh, million. But again, the fact that they are not a highly industrialized country yet uh, means that only one in four soldiers is going to be armed, and that's not. Not acceptable um, when fighting a modern war. Okay. Um, all right. So um, if you're following along in your notes, we've moved um, through page three um, and we're into um, page four. Uh, if you look at your notes, there's something called the first Moroccan crisis. That was a uh, potential conflict between um, France and Germany, uh, and it was an attempt by Kaiser Wilhelm II to isolate France by sh showing uh, support for the Moroccan people who had just been recently uh, colonized by the French, and this is, uh, Morocco is a North African country, and Kaiser Wilhelm II makes a big stink about they are going to protect the, um, the territorial integrity of uh, Morocco against France, and it ends up sort of blowing up in Kaiser Wilhelm's face, uh, his face because um, all the countries, Great Britain included, sort of sides with uh, with France, even though France is seizing additional territory and um, Great Britain and France have had lots of conflict um, throughout Africa when it comes to colonies. Um, Great Britain ends up siding with France over this. So... Uh, this is just another mistake, a uh, diplomatic error by Kaiser Wilhelm II, um, sort of trying to bully uh, people around and the situation around, and it backfires, and so it further isolates uh, Germany uh, prior to the war. Okay, um, <clears throat> so what this, um, what this article here shows is uh, the last of the causes, and that's the assassination of um, Archduke Franz Ferdinand by Gavriel Princip, who was a member of a uh, Serbian terrorist organization known as the Black Hand. Um, and even though this, uh, it was really a rogue group of assassins, that uh, doesn't mean that this isn't a highly coordinated uh, and sort of well-funded um, group, the Black Hand. Uh, there were a number of uh, high-ranking German um, military officers that were members of this. So um, you can say that the assassination was a conspiracy and that um, the Serbian government aided and abetted um, this, this, is, uh, this plot. But what this um, article shows is kind of how they hatched the plan learning from a newspaper 
that Archduke Franz Ferdinand was going to visit Sarajevo, um, and that you know his uh, parade route was printed uh, in the newspaper, and so they had an opportunity to devise a plan for how to do that. And there was um, a large group of assassins, close to a dozen, and on the day, June 28, 1914, only one besides. Um, Gavriel Princep made an attempt on his life, and Gavriel was the last um, in the line. And they had all the uh, members all kind of lined up along the parade route, and only one had the nerve. He threw a bomb at the car and uh, bounced off and didn't hurt the um, Archduke. The other thing about um, it's important, th so what, you know, you need to understand, like, well, what is the purpose of assassinating um, Archduke Franz Ferdinand. What they're trying to do is they're trying to weaken, create a crisis of secession uh, within Austria-Hungary. They're trying to weaken Austria-Hungary's hold on all of these ethnic groups. They want to bust up. Uh, they know they can't defeat them in war, so they want to uh, cause as much trouble, create as much political chaos as possible to help, you know, to, to sort of destabilize Austria-Hungary. And so that's the purpose. And then there's also th this tidbit here that... Um, even though he's, you know, Franz Ferdinand is not yet the emperor, he's the heir apparent, and he's known as being a reformer. And so we'll never know for sure, but the word is that he was going to implement a number of reforms for uh, some of the Slavic people so that there could have been something very similar to what um, would be kind of like a triple uh, uh, monarchy, all right? kind of give the same equality uh, to some of the, the Slavic groups that the Austrian government had already done and given to um, the Hungarians. So they wanted him dead because if that happened, then there wouldn't really be much nationalistic fervor inside of Austria-Hungary. I hope that makes sense. Um, and so they're trying to, you know, destabilize Austria-Hungary. That's their goal. Okay, so that Serbia could uh, swoop in and kind of annex all all of the uh, the territory that is uh, Slavic. Okay, so uh, Gavriel Princep um, finds the uh, an opportunity where the car that is uh, the, the convertible that's carrying the Archduke and his wife comes to a almost to a stop, and he jumps out and he shoots both of them, and he's arrested. And then during the um, interrogation he gives up the fact that there are a lot of uh, other people that are involved in this organization and this is where the outrage comes in uh, and it's sort of referred to as the June 28th outrage the world is uh, siding with Austria-Hungary the world is outraged uh, you know in the in the days after and when news breaks that there's you know high-ranking Serbian officials um, Austria, Austria, Hungary wants, you know, they, they don't just want to go after, you know, because they already have Gavriel Princip, but they're, they're obviously very angry with the um, Serbian government. And so they want the Serbian government to cough these people up and they don't trust that they will, that they're going to handle it. Um, and so this is where um, behind the scenes, Austria, Hungary goes to Germany and asks you know, basically what they should do. And um, the German response is that they should push very hard um, because they should act quickly because the outrage, um, you know, at the moment is very high and the support for Austria-Hungary is, um, you know, sort of uh, united uh, across Europe. And so nobody's going to... <clears throat> be angry if Austria-Hungary declared war on Serbia, but they caution them to uh, to do it quickly because that support will soon dissipate, okay? Over time, people forget about it and will become less outraged. Uh, so Germany offers Austria-Hungary what's known as a blank check as far as promising them unlimited support if they declare war on um, Serbia. So what happens is the Serbian government checks with Russia and Russia promises to defend them. Okay. It's very unwise for the Russians because, you know, even though they have recovered a bit from 
uh, losing the Russo-Japanese War of 1905. Um, they have to understand who they're taking on uh, with Germany. But at any rate, <clears throat> they, uh, they promise Serbia that they will, they give Serbia a war guarantee, okay? <clears throat> so this is where things really start to uh, become problematic, okay? And um, this is where the, where we see that the German high command, and when I say the German high command, I mean the military. The military had way too much influence over political decisions. This is one of the lessons of World War I is you can't allow your, your generals to have too much influence. Um, you know, the, uh, a great um, example of why we don't want the military uh, to have too much influence over politicians, you just look at the... Um, the Cuban Missile Crisis of uh, October 1963, the two-week time period where um, the Soviet Union was uh, secretly transporting and uh, installing uh, nuclear missiles that had the you know the ability to strike anywhere in the United States very quickly, and it would. The problem was there would be little warning, there, um, you know, with Russia being far, the Soviet Union being far away from the United States, our, our uh, ability to detect missile launches and then respond with a strike against the Soviet Union always kind of kept the Soviet Union in check, if it, you know, if that makes sense. But if Cuba only being 90 miles off the coast of Florida, them being so close that they were to launch a missile strike, we may not even be able to get a response. And that kind of gave the Soviet Union an edge. And so that was just like, couldn't have it. Just couldn't allow the missiles to be in Florida. And so um, the President Kennedy, John F. Kennedy, uh, assembled a group of advisors known as his executive committee, XCOM, um, included his brother and uh, Secretary of State, um, and the uh, Secretary of Defense, and then his joint chiefs of you know the branches of the military, and they were gung ho on war and wanted to strike and use nukes and use all kinds of things. And um, the problem was, by the time we figured out that they uh, those miss they had missiles that were already operational. So if we would have struck Cuba with an attack, they may have launched missiles, nukes against the United States, and then then it would have been, and, you know, it would have been nuclear Armageddon uh, after that. So it was quite uh, a relief that Kennedy didn't, didn't rely on his, um, his generals because they were all pushing for war. And so what he came up with was uh, they created a, essentially a blockade. They called it a quarantine around Russia or around Cuba to prevent any new nukes from showing up, but uh, it ended up working. But anyway, sorry, it was very long-winded, but this is a, a point that you're likely to see on the AP is that military, not just in Germany, but all across Europe, uh, military leaders had w way too much influence over political uh, affairs. All right, and if we want to talk specifics, we want to talk about um, this. Okay, I'm skipping ahead and I'll come back. But okay, so Germany's plan to fight a two front war was a big concern ever, you know, as soon as uh, Russia formed an alliance with France. And so they wanted to develop a plan that would allow them to effectively fight a two front war without having to divide their military. So you say, well, how's that possible? Well, it was all based uh, on the premise th uh, that Russia was not very industrialized and because of its vast size and relative lack of railroads that it would take uh, six weeks for them to fully 
mobilize their troops and get their troops to the front line and you know before they can attack Germany okay so the the thought was because they crushed the, the Prussians crushed France in the Franco-Prussian War that they should be able to defeat uh, France you know within that six week time frame okay so the idea was they would have sort of a um, limited troop I can't something's wrong all right they would have some troops here uh, on their eastern flank just but a very small deployment whereas you know 90 percent would be on the western front and they would attack Paris uh, or attack France and then within six weeks they would get them using Germany's very sophisticated rail system to get them back to the eastern front and then once the Ger or once the Russians see that they have to face the entire German uh, uh, military intact that the Russians would stand down okay so when the war starts in July on July 28th 1928 the German Kaiser promised his soldiers that they would be back home before the leaves on the trees began to change colors so he's he's basically saying they'll be home by fall all right by the or by the end of fall so that's not going to happen but they had a lot of faith in this plan it was called the Schlieffen plan all right so the Schlieffen plan called for um, Germany to go through neutral Belgium okay because the common German France border was too heavily fortified and if the Germans attempted to go through here that they would get bogged down and then the six month timetable would elapse and then uh, it wouldn't work but uh, they felt like they had an advantage if they could go through Belgium because uh, the French-Belgian border was not well defended. So the thinking was by going through here um, in a in a flank like in a wide um, flanking move, they could also they could encircle Paris, which is about right here. So the military, the German military, comes in and circles uh, France. And then um, by doing so, they also could prevent Bel or the British from landing any reinforcements on the beaches. And so they could, they could effectively keep Britain out of the war. So that's the Schlieffen plan. And let's go back up here. So Austria receives the blank check from Germany. The Serbians have received a war guarantee by the Russians. So the Austrians issue an ultimatum. Okay, and it's a very strict list of demands that if you don't comply with all of them, we're going to declare war. Serbia complied with almost all of them except for one. And the, the provision that they refused was they re refused to allow Austrian officials to perform an investigation inside of Serbia because the Austrians said, we don't trust you. You, you know, you, we think that you're going, you know, this is your whole government's corrupt and you're not going to really clean house or turn people over to, you know, the, the people who are responsible for the outrage are not going to be brought to justice. So we want to do it. We want to do the investigation. And Serbia says, no, we're not going to allow you to violate our sovereignty. We'll take care of it. And so that was the sticking point. And Austria, they say, purposely made the conditions of the ultimatum very very harsh because they wanted um they wanted serbia to refuse okay so serbia refuses and then you know uh, war is declared okay now um here's the problem when uh, austria issued their ultimatum the russians responded by starting the process of mobilizing their troops and they started mobilizing their troops not on germany's border but on austria's border sort of uh, as a threat to 
Austria Hungary to get them to stand down. Well, what that did was that caused the German high command to panic because, again, the Schlieffen plan was based on this timetable of six weeks so that if they didn't get, you know, it in gear, uh, the, the, you know, the wheels of the war machine moving, uh, they're going to run out of time. And so they pressured uh, the Kaiser to um, make a decision. Okay. So meanwhile, they were trying to convince the Belgian government, the German high command, that they just wanted to pass their military through Belgium and that they meant no <clears throat> that it, even though it's a very provocative act and they're violating their sovereignty, that they had no interest in uh, attacking Belgium, occupying Belgium, or any of that. They simply wanted to pass through. And the Belgian government refused to allow uh, free passage. Okay. And so that meant that Germany was going to have to declare war on Belgium too. So what the German government did was contact, you know, this is all through diplomatic back channels, uh, the British government and their diplomat, um, Lord Grey, and ask what their plans were as far as honoring the treaty with Belgium. Would they, do they plan on honoring it? And um, the British government... Um, sort of vacillated, which means they gave no definitive response because there was not a lot of public sentiment behind the war. Um, you know, the the and they were short. They were short on uh, you know money, um, finances to fund a war. So, but yet they did have a you know. A treaty not only with um, Belgium but also France so he couldn't give a straight answer he just said that the British government will continue to keep its options open which was not not a, any kind of response and so the Germans um, you know and, and so here's the point some historians have said uh, that if Germany would have been told that if Great Britain would have come right out and said yes they are our ally and we will back them we will support Belgium um, you know, that if you attack them, we'll declare war on you. That it, some people say that the Germans weren't prepared to go, they weren't prepared to go at all. So, so Great Britain shares a little bit of blame here because of they, they vacillated. All right, does it make sense? Okay, so that's um, <clears throat> yeah, let's see here, look at these questions. Okay. So uh, where does the, what happens with the Schlieffen plan? The Schlieffen plan fails uh, ultimately. And uh, the guy who was the leader of the attack on Paris was a general, um, Alexander von Kluck. Okay, it's a good name, von Kluck. He kind of messed up, all right? And so let me just kind of show you here. Uh, I don't think I have a, all right. So what we see here with the invasion is, um, you know, as I said, they were going to kind of make this arcing motion down and then encircle uh, Paris and then lay siege to Paris. And the thought is that, you know, because that's what happened prior is when Paris fell, the country surrendered. So the um, Germans came in and the Belgians put up very stiff resistance. They have a number of uh, he heavily fortified uh, cities. Uh, they called them forts. And these forts put up tremendous um, resistance and inflicted some heavy losses on the Germans uh, initially. And the, the, the Germans just basically treated their men as expendable and just... I mean, through as many as they had to against the Belgians, and many of them died. But the response was that once they took over, and once they, you know, or once they started having success and moving through the towns inside of Belgium, they said, you know, if anybody 
resists the Germans if they even get any kind of hint that they are not complying, they will be shot. And so there is evidence to suggest that the that the German government or the German military was pretty heavy handed with the Belgians. So the British press treated that event and called what the Germans were doing to the British civilian population, they called it the Belgian atrocities. And they went so far as to exaggerate the stories of uh, German soldiers raping um, sort of at will uh, Belgian women, Belgian girls, and things like that. There's not a lot of evidence to uh, support that, but uh, they were, why'd they do that? Why did the, well, they wanted to get people angry in their own country to get, because yet they don't have the draft yet to get people to join the military. But they're also thinking, you know, the more outrage they can spread across the world, the better. That could even potentially bring the United States in. So that was sort of what that was about. But anyway, after the Germans come in through Brussels or through Belgium, they start making their move here. Okay. And uh, I could try that again. Jeez. I just want to enlarge this a little bit. Okay. So if you look. You look like right here. All right. So when he was making his move to, you know, sort of southwest, reports came through that there were, that there was uh, the enemy uh, allied forces very close by. All right. They're on their way to Paris, the Germans are, but that reports are that just to the east uh, at the Marne River uh, are the allied uh, troops. Okay. And so Von Kluck had a uh, sort of a conundrum on his hands. Should he continue on and take Paris? Uh, or should he stop and then destroy the, you know, the entire uh, Allied army, um, which is really who the enemy is? You know, once the military is taken down, they won't be able to uh, resist. So he decided to change the plan and, you know, like I said, there was this flanking or arcing motion that they were taking. What they did was they turned south east, okay? And when they did that, they exposed the flank of the German military, okay? There were 30,000 uh, troops in Paris stationed there to defend it because... They wanted to prevent what had happened previously during the Franco-Prussian War. The soldiers that defended Paris, they were just, you know, it was just like a militia. It wasn't, they weren't, many of them weren't professional soldiers. So that's why they were there. So these 30,000 troops were sent to the front lines at the Marne River. This is the first battle of the Marne. And they were ferried or, or transported, rather, um, by taxi cabs from Paris uh, to the Marne River. So 30,000 troops got there. And what they were able to do was get in behind the German, outflank the German military. And that caused the advanced, uh, the offensive to stall. Okay. And so uh, the six weeks evaporates. The Russians have mobilized uh, on the Eastern Front. And so the Germans are forced to divide their military and then ship half of them back to the Eastern Front to take on the, the Russians there. Okay. So. Hopefully that explains all of that. The, the, the type of fighting that takes place on the Western Front um, is, before long, um, becomes a stalemate. Okay, so a stalemate is a term used to describe the fact that there's no clear winner. There's no clear, um, neither side can gain the upper hand. Okay, and it essentially was a war of attrition where both sides suffered uh, very heavy losses, okay? Um, the fighting that takes place on the, uh, the Western Front is trench warfare. Both uh, militaries were sort of operating from the 19th century version of warfare, and that was uh, attempt to outflank your enemy. And the way that you can outflank your enemy uh, from a defensive position is to build trenches. And so both 
the Allied Army and the, the German military started digging trenches. And they dug 500 miles worth of trenches in both directions, okay? So from here, they dug to Swiss, to the Swiss Alps and then to the north, to the North Sea, okay? And so what you have is uh, two opposing sets of uh, trenches and then an area in the middle known as no man's land and each set of trench lines are well defended with barbed wire with artillery with rifles but especially by machine guns the machine gun was an incredibly deadly weapon um, and it's responsible for creating the stalemate because along with outflanking the enemy was the only other tactic and that was frontal attack frontal assault okay and a, a breakthrough so you amass troops at a specific point where you think that the, your enemy's defenses are weak and you throw everything at them at once. And that was the uh, French and also the German uh, strategy. And you only succeed in killing your soldiers because they sprint headlong into a hail of gunfire. Um, from these machine guns and these these breakthroughs were were never um, successful. So this is what happens uh, along the Western Front. It's you know then once the winter hits, the fall, it, it, the the cold weather, the rain, these trenches fill up uh, with water. These are not designed to be permanent uh, uh, camps, but that's what they end up being. Um, and so the conditions inside the uh, trenches are miserable and you get a bunch of problems with lack of hygiene and sanitation. The soldiers are using the trenches to use the bathroom in and their feet are submerged in many times in water. And that creates all sorts of issues with uh, gangrene and things like that. Uh, soldiers unable to keep their feet dry and that just creates all kinds of uh, challenges for that. So this is uh, a mess uh, and the, the the casualty rates on the western front are extremely high all right and what we're going to see is all sorts of weapons that are developed in an attempt to try to break the stalemate the machine gun creates the stalemate but no other technology is able uh, even some of the more deadly weapons like uh, poisonous gas are not effective enough. Uh, even the, the tank, which was uh, invented and uh, designed by the British, uh, they wanted a vehicle, an armored vehicle that could um, um, traverse trench lines. And so that's why they came up with the Caterpillar um, style you know, tracks on the vehicle. But the problem with the tank was they I mean they were pretty effective but they didn't produce enough of them um, and uh, so that that was not, uh, not successful the the gas um, some of the trench lines were too close to one another and so sometimes the winds would change and you can end up hitting your own uh, your own men uh, they came up with gas masks and countermeasures to kind of you know uh, negate some of the effectiveness of the gas but I mean if you did get hit by gas it was Pretty, pretty de, de, uh, uh, terrible stuff. Uh, they had chlorine gas, and then the, the real bad one was uh, mustard gas. Um, the airplane uh, was developed, but a lot of soldiers or a lot of pilots went down during the war, but they say that uh, they, they basically kind of canceled each other out um, with that. And so, you know, there was really nothing that broke the stalemate okay that's going to be left up to uh, the americans when they enter the war they help break the stalemate that's what brings the war to a close this is a picture of uh, some men going off the fight and this is just capturing pretty much what was common sentiment all across europe that the men were very excited very jubilant everybody was you know uh, excited to see the men go off to fight um, because nobody assumed, nobody thought it would be 
nearly as deadly. So that's, you know, very ironic, I guess. Um, the battles of uh, Verdun and the Battle of the Somme River are uh, two battles. Um, and I'll leave you to find out the statistics. But um, massive casualty rates, okay? And it was both of these battles were fought on the Western Front, the Battle of Verdun and the Battle of the Somme. Um, the, um, it's, you know, uh, Germans versus Allies, um, and, uh, the Allies consisted of the French and the, uh, British. Essentially, the, the high rate of casualties, just the significance is that, um, you know, the, the, the strategies are not working. The, the technology is way ahead of the strategies, and uh, it, it, it's a painful lesson um, for both sides to learn that the frontal assault isn't working. Um, and it's only after these two battles that they pull back from these massive um, um, battles where the you know, they're just sending their soldiers to their death. So that's uh, the significance of, of all of, of, of those two battles. Um, the Battle of uh, Jutland, just a um, naval battle, which, you know, Germany's Navy goes up against Great Britain and they lose. And um, Great Britain is going to be able to create a... Um, um, uh, barrier uh, around uh, blockade around Germany and that's going to in the in the end is going to result in the deaths of 750,000 the starvation of 750,000 civilians inside of Germany all right um, the battle of Tannenberg is when the uh, Russians attack the Germans uh, early on in the war and they are uh, whooped severely um, uh, again, as if you look at the uh, notes, you can pick up the statistics as far as how heavy the losses were. But after the Battle of Tannenberg, uh, the Russians aren't much of a um, much of a uh, threat uh, to the Germans. The Battle of Gallipoli is uh, an another area that the uh, Central Powers has success. What we see with the Battle of Gallipoli um, is the um, British launch an invasion of what's called the Dardanelles, which are, if you look at the Black Sea, um, the Bosporus Straits, it's an area controlled by the Ottoman Empire, and what they're trying to do is gain control of the Bosporus Straits so that the British military or the Navy can ship supplies up through the Mediterranean, up through the Bosporus Straits and into the Black Sea to get um, supplies to the Russians. This amphibious assault goes terribly for it's a British led and um, the man who's actually behind the planning of the mission is Winston Churchill, who was the I don't know, he's like the Secretary of the Navy for Great Britain, so that doesn't go well. Uh, we'll talk about the uh, Second Battle of the Marne here in just a little bit. All right, so um, moving along quite rapidly. Uh, I think we're on page 10 of our notes. This is uh, T.E. Lawrence um, right here, uh, a.k.a. Lawrence Arabia. He was a uh, professor of Arabic studies um, in Cairo. He's a professor, spoke Arabic, um, and he was tapped by the British government to um, assemble as many Arabic uh, fighters uh, to go against the Ottoman Empire. And uh, he, he was to recruit, and uh, the tool, the leverage that he was given was that he promised to help the um, Arabic people throw off the rule of the Ottomans and, and gain their independence. So that was promised. By helping the British fight the Ottoman, um, these uh, Arabs would, would gain their independence. Okay. 
so they used guerrilla warfare. Uh, many of the uh, uh, soldiers that he was able to uh, recruit were Bedouin, uh, Bedouins. That, that they were nomadic people and they fought on camel back. Uh, and so they essentially used guerrilla style warfare tactics against the Ottomans um, and they essentially just attacked the uh, the train uh, the railroad lines all uh, all through uh, the Arab or the Arabian Peninsula and so that was uh, sort of the significance of T.E. Lawrence and the Arab fighters uh, they you know weakened the Ottoman Empire these you know, these nagging attacks. Um, but what we see down here is that there is an agreement made between France and uh, Great Britain even before the war was over that they didn't really have any intention of uh, giving all of the land to these Arab leaders uh, that they, in fact, wanted to um, um, divide some of the territory up to recoup some of the losses and their investments that, that uh, you know, that the war is costing them, and that the uh, Middle East had natural resources, uh, petroleum specifically, that they could use to kind of enrich themselves. And so the uh, Sikhs, Sikhs uh, Pico Agreement, or the Sykes, excuse me, the Sykes Pico Agreement uh, is just that this agreement between France and Great Britain to divide some of the. Uh, territory uh up and of the um ottoman empire in the middle east uh, between their two countries and so this violates the promise that te lawrence has made to get the support of the arabs against the ottoman okay so this is talking out of both sides of their mouth and so that's problematic this is the tank that the british released uh or you know developed and i already discussed with you why that was an issue. Um, here's some uh, anti-German propaganda trying to convince their the Brits to you know their own people to fight the Germans that the Germans were butchers, that they were you know barbarians. Uh, obviously, you see a, a German soldier who's bayoneted a Belgian family, and this is a, a woman in uh, clutching her, her her newborn as they've drowned. All right. Um, I'm assuming this has, this would be the sinking of the Lusitania, uh, which was a uh, ship. It was bound for, it was a British liner coming from New York to, uh, I believe it was Liverpool in Great Britain. Uh, two torpedoes from a German U-boat sunk it. Uh, 128 Americans died along with, you know, like a, another thousand British soldiers um and the uh the story that the press went with was that the germans had purposely targeted this civilian ship and 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 again that speaks to this notion that the germans were just barbarians that they would target civilians just because um but the truth is that the lusitania uh was carrying war material all right, and uh, it was bringing it to Great Britain from the United States. There were weapons aboard that uh, ship, and that the German high high command had made an attempt to warn passengers not to travel. That if they if they're going to travel from New York to Liverpool, they're 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 passing through a war zone, and that you know uh, they they have to take that into consideration and essentially they're putting their lives in their own hands by doing so um but the united states said if you don't stop doing that uh you we're going to break off uh, international relations with you and potentially go to war with you and so the germans were really stuck in a tight spot you know in a, in a difficult spot here because they're trying they're using u-boats to counter what the Germans are doing to them. The Germans are using the warships to create a blockade. Well, the Germans are using their U-boats to do the same thing around Great Britain, try to starve them out. Uh, so they're sinking ships that are heading to Great Britain. Well, so what they promised to do um, in response to the sinking of the Lusitania and then uh, another another ship um, 
they essentially, it was called the Sussex Pledge, the Germans said, we'll stop sinking passenger ships um, without giving them a warning first. So what we'll do is surface, get, you know, use SOS to give them a warning and then allow the passengers to get into uh, lifeboats and then we'll sink the ship. And in, then if there are any passengers who aren't in, you know, that don't have a uh, lifeboat that will save them. All right. But the problem was every, so when the Germans would surface to issue this warning, they, uh, the passenger ships were ordered to ram the, the German U boats or they mounted, uh, guns on the decks and they would shoot and try to sink the German U boats. So the, um, the Sussex pledge really wasn't working out so well. And so, um, we'll just kind of table that. All right see all right so the uh the russians uh pull out of the war okay um and we'll be getting into this later but um you know they should have never fought the war to begin with but then a year after the war is fought czar nicholas ii leaves um st petersburg and he goes to uh, the front uh, to take direct command of the military, thinking like that his presence there is going to be similar to what you know Napoleon's presence on the battlefield was that it would inspire his men. And but when he does, he leaves his wife in charge, who is sort of under the influence of this guy by the name of Rasputin. We'll talk more about him later, but um, he was uh, a, a just a, a mess of an individual and he created that there were rumors floating around that this guy who was just really deplorable um was having an affair with not only uh the Tsarina but also some of the some of the four daughters um so he was assassinated but and it just it was a a big mess their heavy heavy losses their unwillingness to pull out of the war forced um Nicholas II to abdicate his throne. Uh, there was a provisional government that continued fighting the war that was quickly established, but that too was unpopular. And then um, there was a revolution known as the Bolshevik Revolution led by a Marxist by the name of uh, Vladimir Lenin. And um, as soon as he took power, he ended the war with Germany and that's known as the Treaty of Brest Litovsk and the Treaty of Brest Litovsk meant that Germany would no longer have to fight a two front war that they could concentrate all of their resources all of their soldiers uh, on the western front to try to break the stalemate that existed okay now there's one other piece to this the other component here shoot we go is um i don't know where is it there was a question about the zimmerman note there it is all right so the german uh navy said that if they resumed in violation of the sussex pledge what's called unrestricted submarine warfare, essentially go back to sinking all ships without, you know, granting a, a warning that they could essentially starve Great Britain out of the war, force them to pull out, and then that it would only be Germany that they would have to defeat. So they planned on uh, January of uh, 1917 to resume unrestricted submarine warfare. But they knew that by violating the Sussex Pledge, that it would be likely that the United States would enter the war against them. And so to sort of hedge their bets against that, um, Arthur Zimmerman um, sends this uh, telegram, okay? And the telegram is coded um, and actually, let's see, yeah, so he sends it. He's the German foreign minister. Arthur Zimmerman sends this coded message <clears throat> to the German minister in Mexico City and that he is to go to the Mexican president and um, 
offer to form an alliance with Mexico and Germany. All right? And with the understanding that if the United States is declare to de to declare war against Germany because they're violating the Sussex pledge and starting unrestricted submarine warfare again, then Mexico is to declare war against the United States. And the thinking is that the United States will not leave their continent, their country, to come over and fight the Germans when they're being attacked on their southern border. They're obviously going to take care of that first. And that once Germany finishes defeating France and Great Britain, they will send weapons, soldiers, supplies to Mexico to help them defeat the United States. And then in return, they'll get their lost territories back that they fought in the Mexican War in 1848. Uh, they lost New, Me uh, New Mexico, Texas, Arizona, California. I don't think the telegram included California. I think maybe they left that out but because they probably forgot that that's also a territory they lost as well. Uh, but the British... Um, the British intercepted the message, broke the code, and then they released it to the press of the United States. And people went bonkers over this, um, that the Germans were plotting against them. And so with that, the United States uh, declared war. Uh, uh, President Woodrow Wilson went before the uh, Congress and said that the world needed to be made safe for democracy. And they declared war in April of 1917. Okay, but the United States was not very well uh prepared for war so it was going to take quite some time for them to get on their war footing until the germans still felt like they had an opportunity to win um so the situation that uh we see many of these countries involved in this war uh in europe is a situation known as total war which means that uh that's the only thing going on, that the government's number one focus is to, to win the war, and that everybody is uh, called to serve somehow, either directly or to serve behind the scenes. But everybody needs to make sacrifices, and um, the sacrifices include uh, civil liberties. Uh, the government is not going to allow people to speak ill, not only of the war effort, but also speak ill of the government. Uh, that that somehow could, you know, damage the morale of the people. And so the government had a vested interest in making sure that they win the war. And everything else was secondary. And again, people's civil liberties as well. So we see uh, countries with strong liberal traditions really pull back uh, because, again, they want to win the war. Also, we see even countries that have a laissez-faire capitalistic uh, economy um, sort of implement a more command style economy where the government goes to factories and says, you know, we're not going to take over, but if you don't listen and comply with us, we will. Uh, we need you to stop manufacturing consumer goods and instead you need to be manufacturing weapons or something of supplies uh, because, the, you know, we need to make sure that our soldiers are getting everything they need. So, you know, countries that were industrialized did that. Great Britain, Germany, the United States. Um, and so that's significant. That's noteworthy that they switch from, you know, sort of a free enterprise style to more uh, command economy, government control, government regulated, government setting prices, wages, etc. Okay. And then it was during this time period that we really see women step in and they uh, begin occupying or taking in the positions that that uh, men, you know, aren't doing because they're off fighting. Well, the big example is Great Britain that, and, and I guess that's more or less how it went in other countries as well, that women very slowly were in, encouraged to take the place of men and the types of jobs that they did uh, were were not very labor intensive but because of necessity that changed and women began to do even the most 
uh, you know, hard labor, not hard labor, but labor intensive types of jobs. And there was fear that the women wouldn't be able to, you know, they weren't up to the, the, the task, but uh, the women proved them wrong and, and you know, served their countries uh, by, you know, taking these positions. Now, they weren't paid the same as their male counterparts, which is not good. And they also willingly gave up their jobs once the war was over. They were told to go back home, and that's exactly what they did uh, to make room for the returning soldiers. And so um, the result, though, is that women uh, received uh, the right to vote. All right. So that's, quote unquote, the reward uh, that we see uh, Great Britain, Germany, the United States after the war. Um, women are uh, rewarded with the, uh, the right to vote. OK, uh, so. The Germans, when they first uh, come into contact Chateau Thierry with the United States, um, they inflict heavy damage on the um, American troops who are led by a um, General Pershing, who insisted that the American uh, expeditionary expedition expeditionary force fight um, separate from uh, the Allies, uh, the French, who wanted to use them just to kind of fill in the uh, the areas where there, you know, were heavy shortages. But anyway, they were first defeated the first time the Germans faced the Americans. They did very the Americans did poorly, and so this led the Germans to suspect that things were going to be the same. So it really didn't matter that more and more Americans were showing up; that the results would be the same. That was. Uh, Miss um, judgment. They 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 got that wrong. All right. They when more and more Americans started showing up. In fact, what we see happening is the American morale is very very high. They're very excited. They're ready for war. Whereas the Germans and everybody else fighting, well, you're you're fighting younger and younger soldiers because the, the most of the other prime fighting, you know, prime aged fighting soldiers are dead. So you're fighting very young soldiers and also very old and the morale is very, very low. All right. And so then what we see with more and more Americans showing up um, over the summer of 1918, that the Germans who are known for being the most well-disciplined military in the world, were starting to see breaks in discipline and uh, refusal, um, widespread refusal, which we call mutiny soldiers refusing to fight and um, even arresting their officers. And so this sends a very important signal to the German high command. They pressure the uh, Kaiser Wilhelm II to step down, to abdicate his throne, and, they, and he does. And then so the Reichstag, um, which is the legislative branch of the German government, quickly uh, establishes a um, provisional government and it's known as the Weimar Republic. And the Weimar Republic begins, you know, uh, uh, approaching the allied nations, expressing an interest to end the war, okay? And so the stalemate um, ends um, on November 11, 1918, okay? An armistice is signed, a ceasefire is signed, uh, in a train car and outside of Paris, um, and the fighting and the war comes to an end, all right, November the 11th, 1918, all right, so the only thing that, that is left is the, uh, the treaty, all right, and so the treaty process uh, begins uh, immediately after and goes until uh, uh, June 28th, of uh, 1919 is when it's finally signed. But the Americans uh, send over their president, Woodrow Wilson, who had tremendous influence because the United States helped win the war. But his ideas, his ideas about lasting peace are very progressive, okay? And it's not anything that the French nor the British nor the Belgians uh, want to hear. But he is pushing an idea that he calls peace without victory, this idea that there doesn't need to be a winner or a loser because when there's a winner, uh, the winner usually takes something from the loser and the loser ends up feeling vengeful and, you know, uh, short changed and that it's going to open the door for future problems and that they shouldn't do that. 
All right, so Woodrow Wilson's ideas of peace without victory are important because he's saying we, we don't need to take anything. All right, the, there shouldn't be any punishment doled out. And I, you know, I think a primary example to look at would be what happened with France when France is defeated uh, under Napoleon, you know, at the Congress of Vienna. They were purposely uh, not very uh, punish, they didn't punish, they didn't give France much of an indemnity and didn't take a lot away from it because they wanted to prevent the French from wanting to, you know, get revenge. So that's the idea behind Woodrow Wilson's thinking here. Um, he also wants to address all of the things, and that's highlighted here um, in this, his 14 points, basically addressing all of those things that caused the war, nationalism, secret treaties, um, these alliances, um, he, he thinks that the other thing is because of nationalism, they should come up with something called self-determination, where all the ethnic identity groups, uh, ethnic groups inside of Europe have an opportunity to vote and decide for themselves whether or not they want to be in their existing country or empire, if they want to form a uh, empire of their, or a country of their own. All right. All right, so that's self-determination. That's also in here. Um, and then um, the 14th point was his most important, was the creation of um, a peacekeeping organization that would uh, prevent future war. Again, sort of like a concert of Europe using principle of intervention, collective security to maintain peace. Uh, but this would be something that would be ongoing all right, not just when a conference needed to be met, there would be. So the League of, you know, the Concert of Europe was just whenever countries decided, and there was only five countries. This was, they are going to invite every country in the world to be a member of it. So it was going to be, you know, uh, something more permanent than what the Concert of Europe was. All right. So that's what he proposed. And that was really the thing that he did not want to um, compromise on. And that's, you know, important to know because Woodrow Wilson goes to the Treaty of Versailles, you know, representing a country that didn't really suffer heavy losses. Um, if you look at the casualties of the United States, it's I mean, just nothing, can, you know, I mean, I hate to describe it that way because Americans did give their lives, but I mean, if you compare what we lost and what we sacrificed to what the other countries did, it's, it pales in comparison. So the point is that I'm trying to make here, um, not trying to be callous, but um, the French especially, the, the Western Front is inside of France. France, the northeastern portion of that country, was devastated. Uh, they suffered um, the second highest uh, number of casualties among their soldiers. I mean, if, if you look at the percentage of troops deployed, they had a very, very high percentage that were um, you know, killed, wounded, captured, etc. Um, so there was, um, you know, tremendous uh, hatred uh, among the French people, and they wanted revenge. And so, when they uh, sent their uh, president, um, he was instructed to make them pay, make Germany pay for what it, you know, for what it did. Um, and uh, so, you know. Woodrow Wilson was going to have a, he was going to have his work cut out for him as far as trying to negotiate and try to sell this idea of peace without victory to the, you know, the French who were quite, quite upset. Um, and that was, speaking of uh, George Clemenceau, okay, who represented the French. And then David Lloyd George represented the uh, British, Vittorio Orlando, the Italian, uh, I don't really think he... He's, you know, he's included in what was called the Big Four, but I don't think Italy really did much of consequence in this war. So they don't even get much. Uh, they wanted quite a bit of territory. That's, you know, if you go back to why they even joined the Allied powers is because they were promised land from um, Austria-Hungary, and they never received that. So they, they felt like at the end of the treaty process that they kind of got uh, hosed, for lack of a better term or expression okay so uh you know the, the the big challenge was you know between uh these two guys uh woodrow wilson and george clemenzo and they referred to as clemenzo as the as the tiger um he just wanted 
you know, he wanted Germany just divided up and destroyed, <laughs> essentially. Uh, but uh, in the end, you know, uh, he, he doesn't get exactly what he wants, nor does Woodrow Wilson. Uh, it's sort of a compromised piece, okay? and that's what we're going to get into. Um, and what, this, what these um, articles show are the ways in which Germany is punished pretty harshly, pretty severely. All the things that uh, Germany has to turn over to uh, to France, to the Allied powers, not just France, but Belgium, and also the British. Um, they had to give up all of their overseas um, colonies that are going to you know, be divided up uh, among the Allied powers. They had to um, create a... Um, a demilitarized buffer zone along the Rhineland, which is the western portion of the country. Um, they had to give back Alsace and Lorraine. They had to reduce their military down to a 100,000-man army. Uh, they had to destroy their air force and their sub, uh, their, their navy. They were not allowed, not allowed to have an air force nor a navy. Um, they had to give up territory uh to Poland to newly create to newly created Poland and newly created Czechoslovakia uh, that's one of the things that Woodrow Wilson was able to get through was this idea of self-determination there were nine new European countries created out of Russia Austria Hungary and Germany uh, so Germany had to give up quite a bit of territory um, but the biggest was, well, there's two big things. They had to pay a war indemnity known as war reparations, the amount of $33 billion. Today, that's like four or five trillion, all right? Um, and the country was already at the, at the brink of bankruptcy. This only pushed them over, all right? Um, and then the, there was another provision put in and this is what justified and this is important I don't know if it says this in the notes but what justifies the war reparations is what's known as article 231 that's the war guilt clause it, it, it essentially lays the entire blame of the war at the feet of the German people um, and again that's done to justify the forcing them to pay the $33 billion in war reparations. And this was something that when news of this gets back to Berlin of the signing of the treaty, uh, the people are outraged that that's, uh, you know, the only way to describe it. And uh, they're obviously angry at the Allied nations. Um, they felt, you know, that Woodrow Wilson's presence there was, was voted very well for the Germans. But they just felt very disillusioned. And not only that, they were angry at their own government, the Weimar Republic. Um, you know, they said that they were stabbed in the back, that they were betrayed. Um, you know, they didn't understand why. But here's something that's important to note why they really didn't have an option. Um, all during the treaty process, the German um, excuse, coast, northern coast, was still being blockaded by the, by the British. So people were still starving to death. And they were only going to lift the uh, blockade. They would only lift it after uh, Germany signed the Treaty of Versailles. So they really, this was a dictated peace to them. They didn't have a choice. They weren't even invited. That's something else that's important to note. The Germans were not invited to the treaty process, so they couldn't even negotiate anything. So the only country that was negotiating really on their behalf was the United States. Um, you know, and that was sort of outnumbered there. Uh, so I think that's that's important to note. Uh, the last thing is that the United States failed to um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Ratify. They failed to ratify the Senate. That's the job of the U.S. Senate is to ratify treaties, and the U.S. Senate did not feel like it. Uh, the uh, head of the Senate was a uh, Republican, Henry Cabot Lodge, and there was a, there's a whole backstory about how he and Woodrow Wilson, like, hated each other, and so he really tried to, 
uh, you know, just um, upend this treaty process. But the but the argument that he made, and it, I don't know, it, I've looked at it a few different times. Who knows if it really said what he claimed it said. But it, he said that, that this provision, Article 10 of the Treaty of Versailles, stated that if, if they required military force for a specific, you know, intervention action that they could demand that the United States provide them with the troops necessary. And so what his argument was that, well, that's a violation of our sovereignty, that only Congress has the ability, you know, to, to make war, that this is upending our own constitution. This, this is superseding our constitution, you know, it's making our constitution, our government subordinate to this international body known as the League of Nations. Uh, and so Woodrow Wilson, you know, toured around the country, giving speeches, tried to encourage people to tell their elected officials or members of the Senate to, to vote in favor of the treaty. And um, it failed. It failed um, that we didn't ratify the treaty. So we, we ended up set, signing a separate treaty with Germany and Austria-Hungary, um, and we never joined the League of Nations. And so that's... The United States was really the only powerful country left in Europe after the war, and the fact that we were not part of the League of Nations made that organization known as a toothless tiger. Um, you know, no real power behind it. Uh, and, um, yeah, sort of doomed um, a, a lasting peace. Uh, so this treaty is... Uh, you know, it was bad for many reasons, and we'll be getting into that in the next unit. But that's it for now. That's all of World War One. hour and 36 minutes. I know it was long, but that was a lot of stuff to cover. So I bid you adieu.